Good evening. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. This is Wednesday night, the well worship. And tonight we're continuing our series on rehab, how we look at our lives and see where do we need to rehabilitate? What is about our lives that we need, where we need God to intervene? And how may we change ourselves to look more like and love more like our Lord? So that's what tonight's about. And we are now in the recovery stage of rehabilitation. So we are recovering. We'll talk about that. We are using, uh, this is my disclaimer, the scripture tonight will be John 3, 4, 18, which is a similar part of the same scripture we use Sunday. We're taking it from a different angle and applying it to rehab. So this is a continuation and a follow-up on what we did Sunday. So those of the people that were here Sunday and did not come on Wednesday, they're just missing out on the rest of it. So you need to tell them that. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for tonight. We thank you for this opportunity again to be with each other and to experience you through word and song. So this night we dedicate to you that you may lift our hearts and expand our hearts so that we may love like you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, hear our prayer. Mighty is our chorus. Mightier still is your love reigning over us. May the words we now receive from the scriptures extend your reign in our lives, moving us with all creation to the fullness of salvation you have for us now and in the age to come. Amen. O oh God, we are here to worship, here to declare the beauty and love we have seen and known in Jesus. We stand in awe before your throne and wait with joy for you to speak to us today. So speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. All respond. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the son of humankind be lifted up so that everyone putting their trust in him would have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God gave the only begotten son so that everyone putting their trust in him would not be destroyed but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to put the world on trial, but so the world would be saved through him. Whoever puts their trust in him is not judged, but whoever isn't placing their trust in him has been put on trial already because they have not put their trust in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. It's the word of God for the people of God. Well, as you heard, that's a familiar story. We used the same scripture, at least part of it, on Sunday. But today, I want to focus on that snake, just for a little bit. I know we touched on it Sunday. But what in the world does a snake have to do with God's love for the world? Or what does it have to do with God sending God's only son so that everyone who believes in him might be saved? What does a snake have to do with that? Now, perhaps some people will think, and I know I've heard this, that that snake that they're talking about is the same snake from the Garden of Eden. But actually, that's not true. Because, you know, the Garden of Eden story was back in Genesis. But the passage that we have here about this snake is from the book of Numbers. This is a story where Moses lifted up a snake in the wilderness. It's in 21st chapter of the book of Numbers, which is a very good book. It's a book that tells the story of the 40 years that the people were in the desert after they left Egypt, before they went into Canaan. So the context of our series, Rehab, right? We have to figure out what does this snake on a stick have to do with us? Well, the Israelites were experiencing... a 40-year period of rehab, if you think about it. They were in a bad place. They were captives. They were slaves. They, they were forced to worship in ways that they were not created to worship. 
And God sent a savior, Moses. And Moses led them out, but they weren't quite ready to accept their freedom, if you remember the story. So they went through some trials. They had to start rehab over a couple times. That's why it took them 40 years to get across. It's really not that far when you look at the map. The delay meant that for 40 years they suffered misery, hunger, thirst, aggravation in the desert. It had gone on so long that not only were they losing faith in Moses, but they were losing faith in God. They began complaining loudly about the conditions they were facing on their journey. We're better off back in Egypt. You might remember them saying that. At least there we had food and clothes and water. And this was not the first time that the people, the Moses, God had sent Moses, their Savior, to lead them out of captivity. This was not the first time here in Numbers that they're complaining. In fact, this is about the fourth time in this book, just in Numbers, that we have a story of the people complaining because they don't like the kind of freedom that they have. But here it is again. And at this point, according to Numbers, the Numbers 21 account, first, 21st chapter, God is getting a little tired of their complaints. Because the book of Numbers reports that after that last incident, God sent a whole bunch of poisonous snakes among the people. Many of them were bitten, and many of them died people that had not been bitten and had not died ran back to Moses okay okay we give up we're sorry please go plead to God on our behalf so of course Moses seeing that the people threw themselves on his mercy and the mercy of God Moses went to God and he prayed and he talked and, and God listened to Moses Moses went and heard the word of God, and God told him, you need to go fashion a snake out of gold and put that golden snake on a stick made of bronze, a bronze bar, pole. So we had this bronze pole with a golden snake. Must have looked pretty awesome, right? God told him that when someone is bitten by one of these snakes, because notice God didn't take the snakes away. God just said, well, when one of them is bitten by the snake, have them look at this pole, brass pole, with a golden serpent, and they will be healed. The statistics would suggest that most people that enter rehab today do not make it through the first time. I don't know if any of you have ever been through it or known anyone that's been through it, but it is quite common for someone that's going through rehab, whether it's physical or particularly for addiction, it may take multiple attempts and multiple failures before a person reaches the point where they realize, I just have to do it. I have to stick to the program. Remember that? They, they admit they have a problem. They follow the program. They submit to the program. And they experience Maybe some intervention, like we mentioned in week two, and then they're healed. But the word recovery, just using that word, is actually pretty revealing. It suggests that healing from something difficult or traumatic is an ongoing process. If you're in recovery, then you're not recovered. See how they use that word? So recovery is a maintenance process. It's where you get to a point where you're better, but you're not there yet. Or maybe you feel like you are there, but if you don't keep recovering, you'll slip back. And this is a good time to recap one of my favorite Wesleyan uh, theological observations where Wesley used the terminology about going on toward perfection. That's recovery. He didn't say you are perfected. He said you're moving on. Always striving to be more and more like God. Striving to love more like God. And in recovery, if someone is addicted and they're trying to recover, they're always trying to stay better than they were. But they say one day at a time, right? Every day you wake up, it's a new day. 
So let's now leave the book of Numbers for a while. We, we've set the context of what Jesus said. He talked about the snake on the stick. He mentioned Moses. Now we know about that. Let's return to John's gospel in the first verse of chapter 3. No, that wasn't one of our readings, but the first verse. This gives us a larger context that we can see that Jesus is mentioning this servant in a conversation with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. That's right. Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is, is famous for a couple things in the Bible. What's the one thing? You can, we can have interactive church. What's one thing that Nicodemus is, is really famous for? He had a real kind of funny line in the Bible. Nicodemus is the one that asked Jesus when he talked about being born again. Well, how can a grown man crawl up in his mother's womb and be born again? You think he was understanding what Jesus was saying? No. But that's Nicodemus. So this, is, this first verse of John 3 begins that conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus had to come to Jesus or felt like he needed to come to Jesus to try to seek understanding because many of the Pharisees were not understanding Jesus. Probably what's more correct is many of the Pharisees did understand Jesus and they didn't like it. They didn't want a Messiah, not like that. They didn't want Jesus to come take away their power, remember? So Nicodemus must have felt like there's something about this Jesus God that's special. I need to go clear this up. So they met in secret at night and they had, they had this conversation. And it was at the end of or part of this conversation where Jesus says in verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, remember, so people would look at it and be healed, the human one must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Nicodemus would have understood very clearly that Jesus was comparing himself to the snake on a stick. Jesus was saying, just like there was something on a pole that you looked at and were healed, now the human one, I, because everyone knew Jesus was claiming to be that person, I must be lifted up and you must look at me to be healed. Jesus didn't have to say that. But the understanding would have been clear to Nicodemus. So now we come to the final context that we must consider if we, the people of today, are going to understand the very important, this very important passage of Scripture of John 3.16 and, and all the passages around it. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions for you. And we can answer them. You can answer them out loud. Answer them to yourself. Take them home. Think about them. Write them down. But remember, the context we have so far. Moses saved people from slavery. Took them out. The people didn't appreciate being saved. They didn't act like they were saved. So they faced serpents. The effect of their sin, right? The effect of their failure to appreciate their new freedom resulted in poison and in order to be healed from their deadly poison they must look at this pole with a snake on it to be saved then we come back and Jesus tells that story points to himself and says now I am the one if you need to be healed if you need help if you're sick if sin has got you down if you have come to the place in your life where you've forgotten what it means to be saved, you better look up at this cross. Look up at this pole. Not made of brass, but made of wood. And see Jesus up there and know that that's the only, the only thing in all of creation that can save us from the death of sin is the death of Jesus. The only thing that models for us the importance of receiving that forgiveness and being healed from that death is the empty cross and the open grave and the resurrected Jesus. So here, using that context, here are some, quite a few questions that I, I thought we should think about. What is the particular context in which the good news that we've just shared is heard by this church on this night? When I say context, I mean, that could be different from each of us, but you need to answer that yourself. 
What is going on in your life? What are your circumstances that make this gospel message of salvation and forgiveness of sins and eternal life, what is it about your personal life? Don't worry about anybody else right now. But what's your context where, where this message is actually good news that you might need to hear? Now, maybe you're in a really good place and you got it. Everything's going fine. You're good with Jesus. But you have someone in your family that's not. Maybe there's people around you at work or school or that sit next to you in church that you know are struggling with this and they need to hear this. The context of their lives might be addiction. It might be pain and suffering or, or hurt relationships. So what is the condition of our lives which requires God's healing? What are our sins? What snake has struck us and inserted the poison of separation from the love of God. What is it that causes us to need to look at that, that pole and see our salvation? What are we hiding from the people in our lives? Because if you answer that question, if there's something going on in you that you can't share with the people that love you, bingo, you found your sin. <laughs> you found your hurt. You found a place where you need healing and you need recovery. What do we wish we could change about ourselves that would bring us closer to God? Unless you're already perfect all the time, then there's something. There's got to be some way you can grow closer to Jesus. But instead of just thinking about it abstractly, let's name it. What exactly, very specifically, can you do can you change? How can you be different that makes you more alike your Savior? From what do we, what do I, what do you, from what do we need to recover? What process do we need to enter? Where do we need intervention of someone of the love of God or others? What program do we need to follow in order to experience recovery the, the ongoing process of recovery are you or is there someone close to you whose sins are making them sick really maybe physically sick maybe just mentally maybe they have sick relationships right or they're, they might as well have a diseased job right? put it in those contexts and are these sins, are these habits, or are these lifestyles preventing us, are those we care about, from being able to fully engage God? Are we able to fully experience the love of God, and are we able to fully love others? Is there anything that's keeping us from loving someone else? Last one. Is there something about your individual life you can, once you get that answered, you can go out to your family, our church, the community, whatever. But start with you. Is there anything about that that needs to recover in order that we are better equipped to actually share this message with someone else? The original sin of Adam and Eve. Again, we mentioned this Sunday. But the original sin was a desire to have the knowledge of good and evil for themselves apart from God. See, God created them and said, you're perfect. Now, if you have any questions, <laughs> you have any temptations, you doubt, you need to know anything about evil, you come see me. I've got that knowledge. You don't need to go eat of that tree. You don't need that knowledge. You have the free will to sin. But you don't have to because I can help you and I can prevent that. Just come talk to me. No, their sin was they wanted that knowledge for themselves. They imagined that they could do it on their own. They didn't need God to save them. After all, they're perfect. Live in a perfect world, a perfect garden. So thinking about this sin, then when we think that we can do something without God, anything, that leads to the rest of our sins. So the first thing we need to do to begin to get out of this vicious cycle 
of our sinful behaviors or habits or hobbies, lifestyles, is we have to admit we can't do it on our own. And we have to ask for the help of God or for others. Once we get that figured out, and some of us have it figured out, and as a church, there are places where we have it figured out, but once we know what to do to heal ourselves, well, now we can start setting up these programs for others, right? And we have them. You, you might call the, one of our programs for leading people to Christ our children's ministry or our, or our youth or our young adults or our adult Sunday schools or small groups or our worship, right? So we have programs in place, but are we healthy enough to invite others in and to really be agents of healing? God has already put every one of us on the path to recovery. Everything we needed to enter into that recovery and follow that path, it was done on the cross. Everything. So because just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved us that he gave his only Son, that when we believe in him, we will not perish, but will have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn us, but in order that we might be saved through him. The good news is that we do have all we need. All we need to do is to look up at that cross. All we need to do to receive God's healing grace is to lift our eyes and gaze in the face of our Lord Jesus. And all we need to do as we're looking at our Lord is to trust in the one we're looking at. And trust that it is Jesus and only Jesus that can save us from the poison that is disobedience, our sin, or separation from God. Only Jesus can transform us and heal us and save us. So may we all ask the Lord to help us tonight to turn away from our sins, to turn away from anything that separates us from the love of God. We know all we need to do that has already been done. Just our claiming that truth and believing in it. So as we celebrate the Holy Meal, which is a meal of remembering, remembering what Jesus did for us, spend that time at the rail tonight as we do in every opportunity. But particularly tonight, put, put your prayers in the context of this great recovery opportunity we all have in Jesus. Ask the Lord in the silence when you're sitting here at this rail to show you where you need to be healed or where you might need to be an agent of healing for someone else. Just as that snake was lifted up by Moses so the people would be healed, we now get to look up at Jesus. And may we all be healed. That's what we're doing. That's what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples. That what they needed in order to be healed and saved for all time was right there at the table, handing them bread and handing them a cup. It was that night before Jesus gave himself up for us. He took the bread, he raised it, gave thanks to you, Father God, broke the bread, shared it with those present, and said, eat, all of you, for this is my body that is broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. When the meal was over, our Lord took the cup, raised it, gave thanks to God, again shared it with everyone, and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. And that's what we're doing tonight. We remember, Lord, your great sacrifice. We remember that you are the body and the blood that gives our body and our blood purpose. You are our medicine. You are our healer. You're our example of perfection 
and strength. And may we hear all of this. May we take in this and remember all that you are so that we may be for the world all that they need to be. May we be a reflection of you that others see and flock to and are healed. Until that day where we gather again at that great banquet table, we dedicate ourselves to you, Lord, and to your ever-present spirit who blesses all here in these elements. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we thank you, Jesus. Amen. This is, my friends, the body of our Lord, broken for you. And the blood of Christ, shed for you. Invite the servers to come forward and any musicians that need to come. It's an open table for everyone. The only requirement for sharing this meal is the desire to speak with your Lord, kneel before an empty cross, experience the hope of resurrection and the gift of healing. And this is the body of the blood of Christ, broken and shed for you. Hail the body and blood of our Lord, broken and shed for you. Body of Christ, blood of Christ, broken and shed for you. Please, Mr. Verse. Again, come as you are led. You'll take the bread, dip it in the cup, spend as much time at the rail as you like. Confess your sins and know. God is waiting to grant that forgiveness. Neighbor, and receive this sending forth. We're still in the wilderness, but we're in recovery. We know we're still broken, but we also know we're getting better. More loving, more just, more like Jesus. Jesus is in us. The Spirit is moving among us and driving us out of here to keep living in the recovery God is working among us. So go in peace in the restoring power of our loving Lord. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the hope of salvation. Go with God.